Hi, my name is Ohio. I am a writer, a researcher in artificial intelligence, computer science. I was formerly involved in several collectives in the San Francisco Bay Area. From the late 90s to the uh, mid 2000s, I was heavily uh, involved in groups like Food Not Bombs, Homes Not Jails in San Francisco, uh, the general uh, libertarian socialist scene down in the Bay Area. Um, later on, I got more interested in software engineering, but I was also interested, um, my military background is in signals intelligence. When I was 17, I joined the Navy and got involved in signals intelligence. So later in life, after I got out of the military, became an activist, wanted to resist what was going on with our foreign policy as far as the United States goes. Um, so I got involved in anarchism and I started to notice some things between my experiences in military intelligence with signals intelligence and things that I have noticed going on in the activist scene. So this work I'm working on is actually based on a book that is based on several years of research which combines uh, military intelligence studies along with uh, computer science studies, artificial intelligence studies, uh, basically the automation of surveillance and infiltration into uh, domestic and international activist scenes, no matter what flavor of activism you're in. Um, you can see these things going on in terms of surveillance which are not necessarily done by the state, actually, but more and more frequently are being done by private security. For instance, uh, vegan activists are surveilled by um, companies that have an active financial interest in selling meat, and they use private security to do this. So we're seeing increasingly military-type surveillance systems being used by private contractors in the private world to harass and intimidate activists across the globe. So this research is uh, things I've been looking into for the last several years. Um, it's, the title of this presentation is Information Warfare or Anarchists, or Libertarian Socialists, as we also like to call ourselves. Um, so basically, I have written this book, and it is called uh, Battle Spaces of Mind. This book is called Battle Spaces of Mind. What this book is about is typically a battle space is usually defined as like a terrain or an area that two, usually two competing forces are vying for, and that is the battle space. In this case, in this kind of surveillance and system that is being done, we're talking a battle space that is composed of the mind. And this is very different from our usual conceptions of war. And the usual conception of war, we're talking about people facing off with usually uh, tools of death to kill each other in a face-to-face -face combat. This is different. This is a war that is based for, um, as they said in Vietnam, for people's hearts and minds, a battle for people's hearts and minds. In this case, a battle specifically for people's minds, and specifically in this case, activist minds to get you to change your positions or tactics or this or that through various covert and even overt propaganda campaigns and various psychological tricks to play on you to get you to do what they want you to do instead of what you really desire to do or what your real goals are or even to change your goals completely. Where this really begins is uh, after World War I, uh, information warfare began, became to become uh, studied scientifically after World War I. Um, some of the first uh, studies on this was done here in the United States. Uh, the Germans and the British, specifically the British were, as far as intelligence work goes, and including this kind of intelligence work, the British being an empire, Nobody could compete with their intelligence networks. Nobody can compete with their intelligence gathering, infiltration, etc., stuff like this, um, during World War I. After World War I, the, the German military, which had lost and had been totally decimated by the war of World War I, sought to um, regain control 
of Germany. You know, we have to understand Germany was defeated at the end of World War One. It was financially crippled. Uh, its military was taken down to a very small size to keep it from being militaristic, which for the Germans was not a problem because they just took everything underground and created what was known as a black military, which uh, they called the Black Reichswehr. Um, the government um, military is what Reichswehr means. It means the government's military. Um, so, what we start off with is uh, Germany and the Reichswehr. Uh, at the end of World War One. Now, we have to understand something about Germany, is that um, Germany is a relatively new nation as far as Western nations go. Uh, Germany was not a nation until um, German nationalism was created in the mid-19th century. Um, before that, it was a various, it was, there were Germanic speaking people of various kingdoms. One of the main kingdoms in the Germanic speaking world was the Prussian kingdom in uh, Eastern Germany. It also has parts of Poland in modern day Poland are also part of the Prussian kingdom. The Prussians were very different um, from say your typical uh, European royal family. The, um, the Prussian royals were, um, they, they believed in uh, militarism, but not, um, but at the same time they weren't uh, imperialistic. Like we know Britain was imperialistic. Britain went overseas. The, uh, their royal families went overseas and they conquered foreign territories. Whereas the Prussians, they were not imperialistic, but they were very militaristic and nationalistic. And they believed in a system where the king was uh, viewed as like, uh, almost like a Spartan uh, king. He was like a military leader who lived a very Spartan life, did not actually advocate uh, gold, gold gilded uh, lifestyles at all. Um, but this militarism took root in, in the German military that developed in the uh, mid 19th century. Um, Bismarck is an example of this in Germany. Um, then later um, during World War I, one of the generals charged with running the war for Germany for the German monarch um, was a Ludendorff, a General Ludendorff, who later became heavily involved in creating what was known as the secret underground army. Since the German Reichswehr was forbidden under the Treaty of Versailles to grow a, a armaments, to grow a large army, it was not to have a large standing army. So they created a secret covert army called the Black Reichswehr. The goal of the secret army was to create a new German Reich, a third Reich. This would be the third Reich because they're already on the second Reich. This is where Nazism comes from. Its third goal is to create a new German Reich that is nationalistic, militaristic, uh, anti-Semitic. It views Jews as being foreigners. They're not really German. Now, what we end up with out of this is a whole um, slew of covert organizations, all based, all part of the Black Reichswehr, but all semi-independent, but also coordinated with each other. And in this sense, you see the you can very much see like the beginnings of the Nazi SS in, in what we know as the Black Reichswehr is a secret military organization that runs things secretly. Which brings us to some prominent members of the Nazi party who in 1919 to 1920, were members of the Black Reichswehr. Some members that were part of the Black Reichswehr that came became the Nazi party, the Nazis in power, 
Some famous ones are like Adolf Hitler himself, Heinrich, Heinrich Himmler, who is, Heinrich Himmler is the leader of the Nazi SS. They're, they're the secret intelligence, they're the secret muscle. They are the Black Reichs there within the Nazi movement. They are the military might, they run the intelligence, they are basically the Nazi uh, machine. They are the Nazi machine. They decide who lives, they decide who dies, they decide who gets into what position, and who keeps what position, they do everything, including support Hitler and keep him up, basically, as we shall see, as a puppet. Hitler, to me, is nothing but a puppet and always will be a puppet. Because, we'll get to this in a minute about Hitler's military career. Uh, some other famous Nazis, uh, Bormann, uh, Goring, uh, Hermann Goring was a leader of the Luftwaffe, that was the uh, Nazi Air Force. This becomes important in the Battle of Britain because Goring advocated the conquering of Britain through air power alone, which never happened there. It, the Battle of Britain was won by the British through their smaller fleet of Spitfire aircraft, which defeated the mighty Luftwaffe of Goring. Another interesting thing about Goring is the Nazi symbol, the Nazi swastika, comes from Goring in its connection to Swedish royals who gave Goring um, uh, a swastika. Before it became the swastika, it's it like a, kind of a, a folksy symbol amongst uh, Germanic people, but later got taken into this very nationalistic uh, twist on things. But uh, Goring, through his connection with Swedish royals who founded the Swedish equivalent of the Swedish Nazi party in Sweden. That's where we get the swastika from, is from these Swedish royals who gave this to Goring and put it, he put it on his helmet and we start seeing these. The first swastika to appear anywhere was actually from that same royal family when they gave Finland its first Air Force plane and they put a swastika on that Finnish air. And Finland was allied with Nazi Germany during the war against the Soviet Union. So we can see that there are, there are several prominent members of the Nazi hierarchy. They're members of the Black Reichswehr. We can definitely see that there is a pattern to who becomes a leader of a socio-political group in Germany based on their connection to military decision makers. But some other um, people I want to mention that were in the Black Reichswehr before they were Nazis is... Uh, Himmler's assistant, uh, Karl Wolf. He was a, a member of the Black Rights Fair, and he becomes important later on during efforts to create Himmler and what become important in efforts to create what is known as a Fourth Reich after the Third Reich is defeated. Um, one interesting character that also comes out of this Himmler uh, SS world, although he is not in the SS, is a, a person named uh, uh, what name? Kurt Janke. Kurt Janke. Kurt Janke. He is um, an, a private intelligence. He runs his own private intelligence. During uh, World War I, he actually came to America and sabotaged um, munitions plants in San Francisco and New York City. He, he was known as an American. Uh, he was actually, uh, some people have written about him as being a part of the American Secret Service. I haven't seen any confirmation of that. But he is a, a German agent that came here in, during World War I. After World War I, he goes back to Germany and works for the Black Rights Fair doing secret intelligence work. He also becomes important in 1922 as one of the prime people responsible for creating the secret treaty of 1922 between the Soviet Union and the Reichswehr to develop secret military intelligence since the Treaty of Versailles forbade the Germans from developing uh, secret military intelligence or secret military technology in Germany. They made a secret treaty with Russia to do it there with Soviet Union communist totalitarian assistance. So you had 
a totalitarian viewpoint of the Reichswehr, working with the Soviet Union's totalitarian viewpoint to create secret military intelligence in a treaty that was orchestrated by Kurt Jenke, who is a secret agent here. And later on, I, I actually have an entire chapter dedicated to, to just the career of Kurt Jenke. Now, we had, I had previously mentioned that Hitler had been, so we all know Hitler, well, we don't all know, but we all know Hitler, Adolf Hitler was a low-ranking enlisted person in the German military. So how does this low-ranking person in the German military eventually become a leader of the Nazi Reich? Well, it's pre pretty simple and pretty straightforward, actually. All right, so we're talking Hitler. Hitler is wounded, and he went to the hospital. Um, in this hospital, he started having, um, people have recorded, Hitler speaks of um, receiving visions in the hospital in his bed. He's having visions of being the glorious leader of Germany in the future. Um, he believes he is the promised one of the German people to save them from this defeat. And interestingly, his doctor is charged with uh, hypnotizing Hitler against his will. Um, so there are all these uh, very interesting things that are going on with Hitler during his hospital stay at the end of World War I. After his uh, stay at this hospital, he's released and he's assigned um, to a barracks, back to his barracks. Uh, basically, every, all the defeated soldiers are just kind of hanging out, waiting to be discharged. Uh, but he's recruited. Hitler is recruited and noted for his skill at public speaking. Very charismatic, uh, very engaging. His eyes, you know, they all love his eyes and they're like just staring into his eyes. And just fall in love with Hitler and his speaking style. So he becomes, um, he's actually credited as a German military intelligence for the specific role of being a propaganda speaker. He's a propaganda speaker for the German military intelligence. At this point, he is trained on how to give effective speeches specifically denouncing Bolshevism within the German military ranks. He's giving these speeches to other German uh, military members. He's trained on how to give these speeches. He's very, it's very specific. He's given the very, uh, he's tutored. Um, but then later, after he is recruited and for the specific purpose by the German military intelligence to be a propaganda speaker, He's recruited to be an infiltrator. And where does the German military command, intelligence command, send him? But into the DAP, amongst, amongst other far-right political groups that he's sent to to scout out to figure out which one, apparently they're trying to figure out which one they could turn into a political machine that they could uh, enact their public policies through. So he is sent to the DAP to check out the DAP, the, uh, the Deutsche Arbeiter Party, uh, the German Workers' Party, which later became uh, National Socialist German Workers' Party. He is sent to the DAP to infiltrate the DAP, and he does infiltrate the DAP. At the time, the DAP has about 100 members. So we can see how, how Hitler's influence, which is not just Hitler's influence, but you might consider that the entire Black Reichswehr decided to go with the Nazis. And it's actually the Reichswehr that creates, in, um, in, in ways you cannot see covertly, the, the Nazi movement. And all far-right parties grow directly out of the Reichswehr and their leadership. Uh, one of the things It's important to also remember about Hitler is that he is also sent in 1922, his Reichswehr commanders, his, in this case, black Reichswehr commanders, because this is after he's out of the military officially. There's no official, in 1920s, discharge from the military, he joins, he, he starts working on the Nazi movement. 1922, his German military 
uh, um, commanders, have them scout out the cat push. The cat push is a, an attempt by German far-right nationalists to overthrow the Weimar Republic, which was the government that was created after the monarchy was disbanded in Germany, and they established a uh, liberal democratic government called the Weimar State. But the cat push, Hitler was sent to recon the cat push and to generally look over how it was being organized. Which later would directly lead into him participating and planning what was known as the Beer Hall Push. I forget the year of the Beer Hall. And the Beer Hall Push was uh, really what put Hitler on the map in German politics. Although they were not successful, uh, what they did is they, they used a beer hall to organize basically an attempt to overthrow the German uh, Weimar government. Uh, and they organized this in beer halls, hence the name. Uh, so Hitler had organized, along with other uh, far right groupings, including financial interests, to overthrow the government. But they, they were not successful, they were defeated. And what happened is Hitler went to prison, and this is where he wrote Mein Kampf. And this is really when Hitler became sort of a folk hero, especially on, on, on the right. But even his influence started to uh, affect people on the left. Uh, at this time, Hitler was actually an anti-capitalist. Later on, he moved away from anti-capitalism. So it's important to understand when we're talking about fascism that we are, we're not necessarily talking about uh, global elites, we're talking about working class people too, who have a different vision uh, about what they want for themselves, but they still have this very anti-capitalist. They can see the capitalist system destroying everything around them, but they haven't quite figured out a different answer from what a lot of other people come up with. So this takes us to uh, an interesting event. So after the Beer Hall push, Hitler's in prison, he gets out of prison, he's written this book, Mein Kampf, everybody knows about Mein Kampf, or most people do. Um, it's then this interesting, uh, like, confluence of interests start to grow together. And this all comes to a fore in 1931, This all comes to a fore in 1931 in Germany. In Germany, in 1931, there is this group created called the Harzburg Front. What the Harzburg Front um, is is basically a, a, a collection of military leaders, financial leaders, and political leaders to create the Nazi movement and its overtaking or taking over power in Germany. The Harz Berg Front. The Harzburg Front decides to take power, basically. This is in 1931. Some important members of the Harzburg Front are um, from the Nazi movement, we get Hitler, we get a Rome, who was later expunged for being queer. Then we get, we have Himmler and we have Göring. Um, amongst the Prussian, again, the Prussian royal family, the official royal family of Germany at this point, although they're no longer in power. Uh, their representatives are at this uh, Harzburg Front meeting, uh, Prince August Wilhelm Hohenzollern. Uh, from the Reichswehr military, the leaders of the Reichswehr military, uh, General von Ludwitz and General von Sicht. Von Sicht is very interesting because uh, although he does become a Nazi general later, he's then sent to uh, China to train the Chinese nationalists. And if you look at pictures of Chinese nationalist uh, soldiers, they have Nazi helmets and they do a high step like all the fascists do. 
So you can definitely see the Germanic influence on these people, right? the, um, the Nazi influence. Uh, von Seat, who trained them. But uh, in the world of finance, which is probably the real power, the real power in all societies seem to be financial and uh, industrial. Uh, some of the important financial players in the Harnsburg Front is a person uh, known as uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt Schroeder. He is uh, famous for being a member of uh, the Schroeder banking family. The Schroeder banking family is a, um, a banking family from Hamburg in Germany and the city of London in London. And we'll get to this interesting axis between the city of London and Hamburg, Germany later and the connections between not only English fascism and German fascism, but global fascism in general, which is all linked in these financial networks. Um, but people, it's important to remember as far as the British come, that Britain was not necessarily as a society, as a country, 